Hello, this is Margaret Ajibola, the STEM Positive Disruptor. And on, my, on the Mia's conversation, I have a special guest, Dr. Katie Perry, the Chief Executive of the Daphne Jackson Trust. The reason why we set up this platform is we want to educate, we want to raise awareness, we want to change people's perception, demystify and, and, and demystify what STEM is, that's science, technology, engineering and mathematics. We want to bring the public into our domain, we want to encourage more young people to consider STEM subjects and also to go into the career. We also want to encourage more people from the diverse background, from whatever the background is, and they're thinking of STEM and how we can do it. But also, this special, the topic we're going to be talking about is returners to work and what the Daphne Jackson Trust do. So um, without further ado, I just want to welcome um, Dr. Katie again. Thank you so much for coming on board. Um, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Margaret. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to come onto the platform today and, and have a have a chat with you. Um, so I'm, I'm Katie Perry, not the pop star. <laughs> That's something that quite often happens. Indeed. Um, yes. it's, it's quite an amusing name to have, actually, at the moment. But uh, no, I'm Katie Perry. And as Margaret has said, I'm Chief Executive of the Daphne Jackson Trust. Um, I'm a physicist myself. And my journey, I think I, I explain it by saying Daphne was the first ever female physics professor in the country when she was age 34. And um, she was quite um, she was quite a force of nature. She really did have some amazing ideas about, um, you know, women in STEM and wanting to return women back to uh, careers. So uh, she was head of my department. I was in the Department of Physics at the University of Surrey. And she was head of department when I did my degree and then at the start of my PhD. And it coincided, unfortunately, with the time when Daphne became ill. And um, she asked me to do all of her talks in schools for her. She used to go out and talk to young people in schools. So I have all of her original old school talk notes still. Wow. Um, and I used to I used to visit her when, at home when she was ill. And it was absolutely tragic that she died so young. Mm. And then the trust was set up after she died to carry on the fellowships she had started the fellowships in the mid 1980s when she was still alive and so i i knew what was going on with that but daphne was quite a mentor to me in my career and she's the reason that i i loved my research um but i loved communicating science more and it was it was daphne and those talks in schools that started me on the journey into science communication um and then the fact i've now come back full circle having had my daughter um and but only I only had a maternity leave, not a longer break. The fact that I've now come back full circle and I'm running the organisation that was set up to continue Daphne's vision, it makes it so personal to me, and it's the reason I think probably why I'm so passionate about it. Do you know? Some, I'm so I was just reading your profile and the things you've achieved. And by the way, congratulations mm -hmm. on your honorary degree for what you Thank do you. with the contribution you're doing mm -hmm. today for the trust, but that, also the development as well. Because yeah. You've taken leaps and bounds. You brought it to yeah. a new um, level as well. So congratulations the, on that. I have to say the honorary degree last year was an absolute honour and a privilege and, and a real surprise. Um, mm. I remember getting a letter from the university. It was um, in the evening in January and, uh, and I opened it completely, did not know a thing about it. And to read that, it was absolutely, I was in floods of tears and, and it was an absolute honour. Um, so no, I really, I really enjoyed that and to, to be able to stand up and and talk to the young graduates um at their degree ceremony you know i'd been there 28 years and 32 years before that um yeah. to give them some uh, words of wisdom was was an absolute honor yeah indeed you know i you know i'm really impressed and I, it wasn't just they gave it to you it's because of what you have also done for the daphne trust and um, you've yeah. taken some new heights and the achievements they've made in in comparison to how the national how we are doing in in the in the national sense it's it's just amazing and you know what i do like you to be able to talk about is the reason why um daphne because oh, you're taking on you took on the baton and you're now mm -hmm. taking to that new height is why did she feel it was important to have returners to work? Because one of the things we want to do is to get into to start thinking about, hold on, there may be people who've taken a break from their career, okay. but they would like to come back. Then, But sometimes you don't give them a chance because you don't, you may, for whatever reasons you have, and that could be uh, maybe because you feel they're too old or they don't have, they're not up to date with their skills mm. for whatever. But why do you think this was so important for where this trust has been set up to enable mm. that? especially yeah. researchers back into 
um, education or research. Yeah. yeah. I think for me, the reason, I mean, going back to when somebody has, say, for instance, if somebody has a, has a child and they have a maternity leave, it's, it's planned and it's planned that they'll probably return. What happens with the returners that we help um, is that they've had a longer break and that they didn't know that there was a way to get back into the workplace. So what happened with Daphne, she told me, was that she was in a supermarket and she bumped into one of her old research students and said, what the earth are you doing working here in the supermarket? You know, why aren't you back at, at work? And they had a conversation and Daphne thought this is absolutely ridiculous because this lady had taken a break to have a family. Um, she couldn't get back into her career at the right level because science moves on. You get out of date, you lack confidence um, mm -hmm. and all of those things. And Daphne thought, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to start a fellowship where I allow people to work part time so they can still manage their work life balance and mm -hmm. their the issues, um, you know, that perhaps cause them to have the break in the first place. Sure. Not everybody can get straight back into a full time role mm -hmm. easily without managing that work life balance. Um, she thought, I'm, I'm going to do a fellowship that allows them to do a research project, a challenging research project, but have an individually tailored retraining program. So, you know, they can they can get back in. And I think that's why it worked so well. And she had seen this firsthand and decided mm -hmm. she wanted to do something about it. So she developed it. She also knew that what a returner needed, if they'd been out of the workplace for a long time, was some guidance and some mentoring and some advice as well. Mm -hmm. So along with our fellowships comes a huge amount from our fellowship advisors of guidance, mentoring, advice, and support throughout the application process, throughout the fellowship. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why they're so successful. But many of the people that we help didn't even know that we existed. They didn't know there was a way back. So what I'd love to do is to be able to get the message out to young people, mm -hmm. to young researchers, to young people, even in schools, mm -hmm. to say, plan a career break. Don't just let it happen to you and then think, oh, there's no way I can get back in actually plan a career break and a quite a few of our fellows have done that because they knew about us yeah. before they had their break they knew they could take a, a short while out of the workplace mm -hmm. and then come back and mm -hmm. i'd love to get that message out there so people n could not only plan to have a maternity leave but they could plan to have a longer break and Indeed. it doesn't just work for people having children mm -hmm. um it's caregiving of any kind yeah. um it's also, you know, if you have illness yourself, yeah. sometimes an illness will take somebody out of the workplace for a few years. Yes. But then if they know that there's a way back in Indeed. and the career breaks we're dealing with, to be eligible for a fellowship for, with us, you have to have had a career break of two years mm -hmm. uh, minimum. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's five to eight years is the average break we're dealing with, um, mm -hmm. people being out of the workplace. The longest break we've ever dealt with is 21 years. Wow. Where somebody had, yeah, 21 years. Um, there was a lady who had, she was an environmental engineer before oh. her break. Mm -hmm. She then had three children, one of whom was severely autistic. Oh, and so she took time at home looking after her children, raising them. Mm -hmm. At some later stage, her son who was autistic had really in, ignited in her an interest in autism recently. Mm -hmm. So she tried to get back in with a, with a postdoc position and found that she was just being turned away and mm -hmm. she thought well, i've got transferable skills and yeah. then she found us yeah. and she did a fellowship she completely changed her area of expertise from being an environmental engineer to an autism researcher and that's one of the other unique things about our fellowships the retraining program allows people to shift their area of expertise mm -hmm. if it's necessary for yes. their future career of course and she's very successfully returned to a career she's managed to um to get grant money to um, and you know work she's carrying on in autism research and she'd had a, a 20 she's um amazing amazing it, lady it, very it, inspiring it, it's so inspiring it's so good to hear that because there are people who may feel that for them to get into a research program like yours or the fellowship they have to have do they have to have a phd they don't from what i understand it as they no, not necessarily. They have to have three years research experience. Right. And that could be just a PhD or it could be. Um, so we're talking um, perhaps if you're an engineer, um, often engineers just go, you know, they don't often do a PhD. They'll, they'll simply work and they'll conduct research. Often sometimes in the pharmaceutical industry, people have um, got a first degree and then they go into um, research in a pharmaceutical company. So not always. Um, 
But we've always offered up till now, we've always offered um, research fellowships to allow people to return to a research career. Mm-hmm. Margaret, it's very exciting this year because we've got something new on the horizon, which oh, is please a, share different, it. <laughs> a different type of fellowship, okay. which is aimed at returning um, returning people to careers in STEM in research support. So these will be people who perhaps don't have a PhD, almost certainly don't have a PhD, but could have. But people who want to return at a slightly different level, um, because clearly returning to a research career and being successful in research is quite challenging and demanding. Mm. And, you know, there's not enough funding for research for everybody out there, let alone whether you're a returner or not. Sure. But there are many, many other um, great areas around in research support. So this could be technicians, it could be um, working on, in organisations, working on um, large pieces of equipment. So the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxfordshire or Diamond Light Source, which is a um, a facility that has, you know, a lot of different um, beam lines that require quite a lot of technical expertise to run the machines. So we are at the infancy of this um, and we're going to be working on it and developing it this year, it's we're going to be rolling it out this year. So I think there'll be a bigger pool of um, people who have started a career in STEM who want to return back to a professional STEM career, but possibly not in research, but in research support. Do you know, this is great. You, this is great news. <laughs> I, I think I didn't <laughs> tell you about that. I thought I'd have a little surprise <laughs> well, this is, it's when we had a chat. Do you know, it's a wonderful surprise. And I think it's so important because sometimes people feel, I don't have this, I don't have that. But what you're saying is that now we are now creating an opportunity. We have on, we have identified that there is a need for this type of fellowship. We also know that there are people who can fill in that support side of things rather than being a research a researcher in that aspect. And I think it's so there's so many people out there who, if they hear this, they want to be part of it as well. Because one of the things that I think we don't have is knowing where to go for information fellowships like yourself that you're providing. And I think having this platform, we want to share that sort of information. We want to bring it to the public. And those people who say, well, my career is over, what can I do? But there is something you can do now. And Absolutely. Well, one of the hardest things we find is actually getting the word out there because we're a, we're a tiny charity. There are, mm. there are 13 staff. Um, I'm the only one that works full time. Everybody else is part time. We're the equivalent of sort of nine um, full time people. Um, what we find is that it's it's actually quite difficult to get that message out there. So, so doing um, things like this with you is amazing because hopefully it will get the message out there. We're just starting to try and do a little bit more on social media to, mm-hmm. to get the word out there a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you know what I would love to see? I would love to see the government put some money towards um, how in the past they've had advertising programs where um, they're trying to encourage people into the team. I mm-hmm. wish they would put some money into helping organisations like us and, and a couple of others that I know of to actually advertise the fact that we're there. And if you've got an interest in and some qualifications in STEM and you've taken a break and you want to return, then there's a way to do it. Because, I mean, we're here and we, we work in a certain um, area. There are there are a couple of other organisations that work in a similar way to us, but with a slightly different um, target audience. Of course, of um, course. So there's a few of us out there in the whole returner space. Yeah, um, yeah. And it would be really lovely to get a little bit more traction behind getting the word out there so that people would know what to do indeed and this is again this is why we do what we do and you know i I love the fact that you you mentioned this and because one of the things i was hoping you also bring out is what would you like we want to start a conversation what the government to be involved what the government to start thinking beyond their remit because we have to be projecting for the future not just as we are now because things change all the time and i think it you know you made a good point about the government has to back what you do because you're doing a great job, especially where returners are concerned. They have valuable experience. They have aptitude that you, you're you missing. We're missing out in such a chunk of people that will make Absolutely. a difference. And so if we're not being, I don't know, being forced out or looking at things in a different way, we'll lose out. And then we, what I don't like is we complain about what we don't have, but we're not willing to invest in things that yeah. can make it make a difference. So yes, I'm definitely going to be sharing this <laughs> and getting people. <laughs> and yeah. we, want, I mean, we want the government to talk about it and do something. Oh, a- absolutely. I mean, I mean, government are getting there slowly. 
they yeah. generally have previously had a tendency to want to fund new projects, mm. something new and innovative. But then yeah. you end up with lots of little new projects. What they need to do is um, actually put some backing behind organisations like ourselves and others like Women Returners who are doing a job that we know works. Yeah. I'm thinking about obviously diversity and inclusion um, in STEM. I'm I'm waiting to see what the government is going to produce. So within government, you have um, select committees. So there's a House of Commons Science and Technology Select Committee last year that had an inquiry into mm -hmm. diversity and inclusion in STEM. That there is going to be a report launched next week. I believe okay. it's Thursday mm -hmm. um, from that inquiry. Now I went along and gave evidence at that. A lot of other colleagues of mine that work in um, organizations that share a common goal towards increasing um, the diversity and inclusion in STEM mm. were also there giving evidence. And we, I'm hopeful that there will be some concrete suggestions that are coming out from this report, but I'm yeah, waiting until, you know, next Thursday when the report is launched to see exactly what the recommendations will be from that committee to government. Mm. Clearly government have to then take up those recommendations, but mm. it will be very interesting to see um, because lots of really great evidence was put forward. Great. Do you know I I I hope I hope it makes a difference, and I hope yeah. Because sometimes we you know that there the, there have been initiatives like this before, and we don't always see the impact it has, or it only goes mm. to a certain. And I, I, in, and I think we need to. I don't know. I hope the government is really listening, or will listen mm. to what the the suggestions or the recommendations are, so that they can showcase that at least this will be their legacy that we are listening and we do want yeah. that change itself. Mm. So yeah, I'm looking forward to see the report. Is it next week? It's we'll going to be like, next yeah. week. I think next Thursday should be. Yeah, so yeah. I've been told. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, again, that's what we that's what we do. What we do. That's why you do what you do as well. Yeah. We want to make that difference. We want to change how we we do things and make it better for us, not just as individuals but also as a society. Because for us to change, for any individual to change, we have to show that we mm. understand. We want to make that difference. Diversity and, and inclusion. What does that mean? Because how we interpret that also mm. determines what we then project out or what we then bring to mm. bring to the table itself. And so I, I do hope that just listening to you and other people mm. who listen to you will see this is a very important thing and they will be watching out for this report that's yeah. coming out next yeah. week as well. Let's hope. Let's hope. <laughs> I think, do you know, it's, it's interesting you say that because I, I work with a lot of, we collaborate and work with a lot of other organisations, a lot of learning societies. Um, the subject specific learning societies, um, lots of universities and others and funders. Everybody has a slightly different take on um, equality, diversity, inclusion, etc. We're all working towards a common goal. But what's happened, I think, with some organisations in the past, and, and this is really unfortunate, is that if you get terminology slightly wrong, mm. if you, um, for instance, don't quite phrase things in the right way, especially with, with it, the explosion on social media, what it ends up doing Mm -hmm. is it ends up meaning that people don't sort of put the head above the parapet and go, yeah, we're doing this. They keep quiet about it. Or maybe there's a reticence to do as much or say as much and have mm -hmm. a view mm -hmm. for fear of being, um, you know, shot down on, on social media and ending up with a bit of a media storm around what you've said. said yeah. And I think that's a great change. And I think there should be an understanding that obviously organisations are doing their very best. And for instance, we had on social media um an organization coming to us saying you know about around our terminology this was a couple of years ago around our terminology that we had men and women mm -hmm. um and we should have they were saying well you know your fellowships are not open to anyone um with a different gender identity then and and it was like well of course they are mm -hmm. you know but we have to and we've changed our terminology we understand and accept mm -hmm. that we want to make everything as inclusive as possible. possible. So we have changed our website to say yeah. individuals, yeah. which encompasses everything. Indeed. But there was no intended offence there. Mm. And anyone that knows us as an organisation would know that we are clearly as, inc as inclusive mm. as we possibly can be. Mm. Um, but I think this is a, an exact example of what leads some organisations not to drive forward as much as they could. Yeah. Um, so, so and, and do you know what really annoyed me? <laughs> is the organisation that was um, basically criticising us was called the Women in Academics something network. And so they had women in their title um, and then they were criticising us. So I think 
there's undue criticism sometimes. That there's clearly times when offence is is made but not intended. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the thing that people have to to pick apart. Yeah, that's that's so true. And you know, ever, yeah. Do you know it's a debate? <laughs> we can have a conversation. We, you know, we can have a whole debate about that. <laughs> it, 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 but you know, you're you're right, and I think this is the whole thing because when we translate what or what, when we interpret a word or how we describe things, how it comes across to them or that how they re receive it and translate in their mind, I mean, we're completely different unless yeah. unless they speak to the person direct or the organisation yeah. direct to to get a a, a, a first hand. Um, understand what do you mean by what you have oh, said yes and, and then it, it you then the clarity comes into place but we don't always do that we just make that assumption oh no this and that mm -hmm. and then as you said a storm <laughs> takes place which was not really intended at no, all. not intended it's, it's very that, unfortunate when that happens yeah it's crazy though i think we we're too okay. No, let's let's leave that. <laughs> we better. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I as I said, that's the subject I'm, of another podcast. It, it, it is indeed. But you know, I I'm just celebrating you. I'm celebrating what you've done. I'm celebrating what the Daphne Jackson, Jackson Trust has achieved. And I like the diversity in the fellows have come through because you've oh. got have both male and female coming coming through, and people mm -hmm. of different backgrounds as well. And I also like what you're now trying to do because you now you've noticed there is a gap and there is a need and this this new initiative when it gets launched hopefully sometime this year it will make a difference it will open yep. the, the opportunity for wider audience or wider people who are looking to come back into the yeah, environment we want, to, we want to broaden what we do we've already broadened so that in in 2020 yeah. we were originally just um in stem and obviously i realize your your podcast is about stem but we did broaden our remit to include arts and humanities and social sciences fully in yeah. 2020 um and we've had a lot of interest from researchers in arts and humanities and it's it's excellent and um we're loving that um and we've also included the republic of ireland now as well as uk so yeah. so we're looking for ways to develop um all the time but, it, yeah. but in a careful way because obviously we to be mindful of um of resources and what we can do we don't want to dilute what we do because no, yeah our success rate is is so good so we're awarding around 25 fellowships a year Mm. um at the moment mm. um and i have to say when i talk about the trust i love to talk about the fellows because they all have such a different and inspiring story no one fellow is the same same we cover all different research areas and mm. some of the research areas that they cover are phenomenal mm. and so interesting mm. i mean i love the variety i have um mm. with my role yes and yes. You know, they really are with everything that they've been through. And we have a whole mix of people who've had a career break for more traditional reasons, like having and rearing and looking after children. Um, yeah. Um, but otherwise, you know, perhaps um, fathers who've taken the caring role to look after children. Yeah. Um, also caring for other relatives. One of our fellows, he was a really promising astrophysicist at Cambridge. He was Italian and his family were in Italy and his father very sadly became ill. And, you know, with the strong family values that they have, mm. he felt it necessary to leave his career in the UK and go to Italy to sort mm. out the family business, the business yeah. get his siblings involved a little mm. bit more. And then at some later stage, I think about three or four years later, he was able to come back and obviously thinking, well, that's it. That's mm. that's my career gone. But no, so we he, he had a fellowship um, and is now very successful in uh, reigniting his, his career. Yeah, yeah. That's wonderful, you know. And this is why we have... The likes of your your uh, the type of project you do the trust for Daphne and Jackson and what you do and what you've achieved because you know you said it's about four hundred and fifty fellows come through you and not only that you know you've had what is it about how many professors ah so yeah quite a lot I mean yeah. I can't <laughs> read it <laughs> we've awarded actually we've awarded about four hundred and seventy fellowships oh, okay. now from when Daphne started yeah. um every five years we do a survey of our former fellows and uh, we have a great response they they all want to keep in contact with us and, and we're in contact with the majority of our former fellows actually as well as all of our current fellows um and all of them they want to give back and, and so they they fill the survey in and 
we have realized that I think 10 of our former fellows now have gone on to become professors, wow, which is a rate ten. that is five times the national average for the research workforce. So, so they're very, they're very successful. Um, Indeed. And that's so. all down to your leadership as well, because you're visionary as Def Jackson was visionary. You took on that lead. You, mm -hmm. you can see her vision and you, you carried it through and now you're taken yeah. to new heights. And so, yeah. do you know, I, as I said, I'm celebrating what you have achieved. I'm celebrating what the Daphne um, Jackson Trust stands for and what they have done to enable returners back to the research industry uh, or education or whatever teaching uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. But also what you're now trying to do to extend that, yeah. with, you know, having um, support um, people that will support the research side of things. So, you know, that is a win win uh, when people hear that they know that you are doing great job. But also, as you say, there are other organizations trying doing the same thing. And it's about sharing that information, getting people to see or know where to go. So yeah. very, very brief. I know you talked about the government has to back what you do and promote what you do. So yeah. what other things would you like to see change or see happening? Because we want to spread the word. We want to get people to start talking about it and doing yeah. something about it too. So please. I mean, uh, it's, the thing is, it's a tricky thing because you want to you want to obviously increase interest in yeah. um, in what you're doing, but then you suddenly don't want to be deluged with with either people. Somebody said to me, you know, what what would you want? You know, if you could if you could have anything you want. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, somebody said, I said, well, you know, a few million quid, an extra day in the working week and the ability to clone myself would actually be quite nice. I could get a lot more done then. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, if somebody gave me limitless money and said, scale this up by a factor of 10, I, I don't think I could. Because yeah. intuitively, we are helping a subsection of the population with our research fellowships that have had to have had a career break for a family caring or health reason and have that research experience. My gut says that... The number that we've got is about right. Yeah. Um, with the um, with the other um, fellowships that we're going to be offering, I think yeah. there's a huge, there's a bigger pool of, of people. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think it, it's difficult to know how you'd want to get this out there and how you'd how you want to promote us and our other um, organisations that we work with, so that everybody you know knew that we were there. And I think certainly through sixth form um and people doing degrees that would be it would be really nice to be able to have information out there so that they would know yeah. um i'd love for i always used to say actually what we need is we need adult careers advice services that will rather than just a, through through perhaps um, i mean i realize that people wouldn't get careers advice if they're out of work through the job center um mm. and through department of work pensions but something different for people who you know are at university or who have taken a break back there needs to be some kind of service where you know they can go and find out what all the opportunities are yeah generally what we do is we make sure that all of those organizations that we work with who sponsor Daphne Jackson fellowship have things on their website mm -hmm. but still word of mouth is the most common way that people hear about the trust Indeed. so we advertise ourselves a lot to the existing scientific community mm. who know of maybe colleagues friends partners who've been in research and then taken a break so mm. there's a certain amount of that but i think to actually get the message out there to people who are younger in sixth form and in university sure. um, would be a really great way so that they knew organizations like ourselves and women returners and um, stem returners were there yeah and then they could plan a break Indeed. it could not be something that happens to them that yeah. they have to recover from Indeed. We all need to be a little more proactive with the opportunities um, that are available. So, God. you know, I just I would need more resource and money to actually to get some materials and, and other ways to actually promote us and our our sister organisations, you know, it, in universities, I think, and certainly perhaps in schools in sixth form. In, indeed. Well, you know, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is uh, this is why we do what we do. We want to educate, we want to raise awareness, awareness, change people's dis, uh, perception mm -hmm. and demystify what STEM is. But it, that also includes art as well, so STEAM really, S-T-E-A-M. Yep. So we're yep, not, yep. <laughs> want to be inclusive in that respect. So, but you know, I just want to say thank you very much, um, Katie, for just being part of this 
conversation and just sharing what you do. And I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm really applauding what you have done and how you've taken to new heights as well, mm-hmm. carrying that vision that Daphne had in the beginning. And you know, no, you're a young student. You were, you started as a science communicator, and now look mm-hmm. at you now, a chief exec. Yep. But you know, that is that also will show what's possible again to young people coming up or people in general that look if if um, Katie could do it I can do it too so again you know Margaret it's been an absolute (laughs) pleasure speaking to you and you've really touched on something there because I do actually when I go out and I talk to um to kids in schools I talked at my daughter's school once actually and I I think um they were all for kind of getting them to concentrate on their A-levels and get through and I said look it's fine if things don't work out the way you you know the way you think have a plan in life yeah. mm. but also it doesn't matter if, you, if things don't go according to plan man, so i think being flexible and being adaptable living a little bit first to know what you like and what you don't like um is an ideal thing um mm. and uh, and just enjoy enjoy the adventures and enjoy enjoy life indeed well again you know, thank, I can talk with you all day, but I know I, yeah. I really do want them to listen to you. And, you know, half an hour is more than I love to do yeah. that. But I think also because you brought some nuggets out about the government also supporting um, projects or programs like yourselves and other um, programs, uh, initiatives similar to what you do as well. But also yeah. about getting it, getting the message out to the public yeah. so that people who maybe have... Um, uh, uh, in, in sort of like research and have stayed, have gone, had just had the break due to whatever reason is, reasons mm-hmm. are, they're able to say, hold on a minute, the De- uh, Daphne Jackson Trust do allow this, they have fellowships, mm-hmm. maybe I should apply for this. And this is what we want to do. We want to encourage that, we want to bring, mm-hmm. change the way we do things and also to stop the, uh, deal with the skill shortage that we have or what we say we don't have this or that, but we have, if we can actually oh, beyond what we see as a norm. Absolutely. So There's a hidden pool of talent indeed. out there. That's um, right. There really is. There really is. I think maybe Margaret, we need to we need to try and find a few social media influencers so that we can get to their network. I, yes, I know. I'm working on that. So we always get the word. But you're right, though, because again, no one one person can do it. But we also that's why we do what we do. We want to share and spread the word so that people yep. can see what we're doing, but also see the organisations that we talked or people that we talked to. Look. If they can do these things, if this is available, why, why, why wasn't I aware? Maybe I can help somebody else to tap into yeah. that resource itself. Mm. That's why we do what we do. So yes, yeah. well, thank it's you. Been an, it's been an absolute pleasure. Well, it's my and pleasure, really. <laughs> I, I think we're a good team. We need to try and get a slot on this morning. That would get us to a few more people. Yes, <laughs> maybe we should. I mean, <laughs> we should do that. <laughs> Anyway, look, thank you so much. I know you've been very busy and I know that things happen, but again, I'm so yeah. grateful that you were able to come onto yeah. my platform to have this conversation. Yeah. So thank you it's so much. Lovely. Thanks thank very you. much, Margaret. Thank you so much. Okay.